Hello everyone. So my name is Ziol Hakmunim. I'm an associate professor at the University of Southeastern Norway. And today I'm going to present this paper uh, on autonomous ships for container uh, for container shipping in the Arctic. This paper is co-authored with also Professor uh, Adolf and Professor Theo Boom and uh, Professor Halver from my university here. So, first of all, we know that there has been some development of autonomous ships over the last uh, decade, last ten years or so on. So, but what is the really the, what is the relevance of this autonomous shipping development? So one of the main reasons that we find in the literature is cost reduction. Okay, here we can see a breakdown of costs. Here, this is taken from the Martin Stopford uh, Maritime Economics book. If we look here, we see that okay, we have five categories of cost, right? And in operating cost, which is about normally 14% of the overall cost of uh, running a vessel, here we see about 42% is manning cost, right? Also with autonomous ships, there is possibility to reduce voyage cost. We see about 60% of the cost goes to voyage cost, uh, about 40% here, right? So overall one of the main idea was reducing cost from the manning cost when we go for higher level of autonomy we reduce manning cost and also we uh, try to reduce voyage cost but on the other hand the capital cost is likely to go up but another main reason is increasing safety over time here i have taken this uh, data from the japan uh, uh, shipping data where we can see the accident data from 2010 to uh, 2022. So here we see for different types of shipping categories, we see the numbers. If we see the trend over time, we see that the number of fatalities or accidents has been decreasing over time, right? So one of the explanation of this could be that over time we have been doing uh, better uh, technological advancements and with technological adv advancement we improve the safety and finally lack of seafarers especially in within the developed countries there are uh, some lack of uh, seafarers we see that majority of the um, seafarers are actually coming from China Indonesia Philippines and uh, Russia and Ukraine so but while we have lack of seafarers from the developed countries and that's why that uh, that's why the development of autonomous shipping has been fueled more in the developed countries but at the same time because the developing countries are really doing the supply of the seafarers in the market they're a bit concerned about the development of autonomous ships but now so we know that in the arctic there are some risks associated with um, uh, shipping in the arctic so we try to see that, okay, can autonomous ships be a viable option for shipping in the Arctic? And if so, which autonomous ship mode should we use or which autonomous ship alternatives should we use? So these are our research questions here. So first, what are the most important criteria for autonomous ship deployment in the Arctic? And then which autonomous ship alternative is the most viable for Arctic shipping? So to address this, uh, to address this two research question, we adopted a multi-criteria decision-making framework, and we know that in multi-criteria decision-making frameworks, we have to decide on criteria and we have to decide on alternatives. So here, first we start with the alternatives. So our alternatives are mainly the autonomous ship categories. But before we go to the autonomous ship categories that are considered here, we Go, we, we cover a little bit of the levels of automation. So according to the International Maritime Organization, there are four degrees of automation. Okay, There are several other uh, degrees of automation provided by some classification societies and some other organizations, but here we use the IMO framework. Okay, 
So here in the first degree of autonomy, we say that it is a decision support model where no remote control center is needed and the vessel is not going to be unmanned. But with a bit higher degrees of autonomy, we start using the remote control center. So the ship will be controlled from a remote control center in the shore. And but in the degree two, still it is not unmanned, but we will reduce the crew significantly. Maybe there will be only one or two crew on the vessel. And then degree three autonomy here, it is controlled by remote control center and it is unmanned. And then for the fully autonomous automation, remote control center will not be used, but only during hazards. And then it will be of course fully unmanned. So in this study, we actually consider the degree three, degree four, these two levels of autonomy and also something called vessel platooning. So in the vessel platooning, normally the technology is like one, there will be one leadership and the ships behind that leadership is connected to the leadership via wireless technology. Okay. And this technology has already been tested in some of the EU projects and that has turned out also one of the cost effective Solution. So here the first vessel is manned, but the follower vessels are not manned. They just follow the lead vessel. But then for the assessment of for, for the assessment of um, of the autonomous uh, ship adaption in the Arctic, we have to define some of the criteria. What are the most important factors that influences the decision whether we should use autonomous ships in the Arctic or not, and which autonomous ship should we use? So we did a literature review. We talked with some of the industry experts. Then we come up with eight criteria. So the first one was OPEX, operational expenses. The second one is capital expenses. Here we can see the details. Then in the second group, we have the navigation in harsh weather and in complex geographic area. We have ship to shore run, ship to ship communication. We have search, queue, search and uh, rescue operations. And then we have environmental protection, legal framework, and geopolitics. So these are the eight criteria that were considered for the evolution of autonomous ship alternatives for Arctic. We use the best torch method, one of the multi-criteria methods that has been redeveloped in 2015. We know that the analytic hierarchy process, um, toposis, those were some of the uh, very well-known um, multi-criteria methods. But here we use the best torch method for its uh, simplicity and the way it reduces the number of pairwise comp comparisons required. So here we follow five steps. And so in the first step, we ask the maritime experts to identify the most important criteria and the least important criteria. So out of these eight criteria that we listed, what is the most important and what is the least important? Okay, so that's what first we ask. The second step, so when someone defines the most important criteria, we ask them how important it is from the other seven criteria. For example, if someone says capital cost is the most important criteria, then they have to rate in the second step. So how important is capital cost from the other seven criteria? Here we use a rating scale from one to nine. And here one is uh, equally important and nine is uh, strongly more important. So if someone selects nine, for example, let's say when comparing capital cost with geopolitics and someone puts a nine there, that would mean that capital cost is nine times more or like very strongly more important than geopolitics. So in the third step, we kind of do the opposite. Okay, so here we ask the maritime experts to compare the importance of the seven other criteria with respect to the least important criteria. And the step two and three, actually from step one uh, to three, this gives us two vectors with some numbers, okay? And then we can use those vectors for uh, getting the weights or priorities in the best source method estimation using the algorithm proposed by the, uh, it's a simple linear optimization problem. So using that, optimization uh, algorithm proposed by the founder of the method Zafar Azai. 
and then we can do the calculation of priorities for the Arctic, uh, for mass alternatives for the Arctic. Here, we in this study, we had 16 responses. Uh, here you can see an overview of the res uh, respond respondents. So majority are from Norway, but we had some people from Canada, Australia, Finland, and France. We reached out people who has been publishing uh, in or publishing in autonomous shipping or Arctic, and also if they were um, in industry and doing research or development in Arctic and autonomous ships related topics. Sixteen responses. Um, it's it's. It's an acceptable response for multi criteria decision-making methods. There are uh, studies with lower responses, but it's always good to have more responses. Like if we could reach 30 or 40, it would have been, of course, better. Here we see the results uh, of the analysis. So here we see the most important criteria was the operating expenses, then environmental protection, then navigation in harsh weather, and then the legal framework and the ship to ship communication were considered least important criteria. And yeah, these were the alternatives uh, analyzed. So we had the fully autonomous, we semi autonomous, so the degree three and four from IMO, and then the vessel platooning. So this is how we, the vessel platooning works. So we have a fully manned leader vessel, then reduced or without any crew vessel um, following the leader vessel. And we also put the conventional ship here as a benchmark. Just wanted to see how it compares with the other alternative uh, options. Here we can see the results. So if we first focus on the first figure here, we see the blue line is for operating expenses, right? So when we consider operating expense, it seems actually uh, the fully autonomous or the semi-autonomous, these two turns out to be uh, some of the best alternatives. Okay. Uh, for example, if we consider the capital expenses, this line here, this, this ones, it seems the conventional vessel is considered to be the best alternative. So similarly, we can interpret that figure. If we look here, for example, in geopolitics, so if we consider geopolitics actually, the conventional vessel is considered the most uh, feasible. Okay, if we look into, for example, search and rescue, then it seems uh, the conventional uh, might be the uh, best option here as well. Okay, so, and here we can see the numbers. Uh, so the ranking of the ships for each of the criteria that we used. So for conventional, we see the numbers here. It has the highest rating on, 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 on average. And then the second best option was semi-autonomous. Okay, so here we can see the ranking of that. And here we can see the results. Like we did a robustness check with vector normalization approach. So it is very common to use during the prioritization phase. It is normally we use this linear optimization, but we also use the vector op optimization approach, vector normalization approach to uh, kind of double check the robustness of the result. So overall, we see that conventional vessels were the most prioritized by our sample, and one of the reason could be that you know we are we don't really see fully autonomous ships or vessel platooning uh, functioning uh, in the real world. And maybe we are still skeptical to that to some extent. But apart from that, actually, the semi-autonomous option is the most feasible, OK? So the takeaway from these findings is that, you know, if we were to if we were to adopt autonomous ships in the Arctic, we should use degree level three autonomy, semi-autonomous ships. We should not go for fully autonomous ships we should maybe wait for vessel platooning, although vessel platooning is very similar to uh, semi-autonomous ships. Um, actually, yeah, vessel platooning could be an option too because the rating of semi-autonomous and vessel platooning was almost the same. So yeah, that's uh, the main findings uh, from this study and thank you for listening. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Okay, so...